Thank you. Um, so I'm Hannah Fluck. I'm senior national archaeologist at the National Trust. I'm also vice chair for Europe of something called the Climate Heritage Network. Um, and I'm also part of the CIFA Climate Change Working Group. I think that's what we call ourselves. So um, I also skived half the conference, so I feel like a total fraud. And quite gutted I didn't find Mr Motivator. Um, I'm going to start with the brilliant quotes from colleagues of the session that we had this morning. Um, I am not an expert was a phrase that that came up and actually is one that I hear quite a lot in the world of uh, climate change heritage. Um, the imposter syndrome is very real as we try and engage with some of these sectors. Uh, we don't feel comfortable, we don't feel qualified, and yet every person that has uttered those words, I am not an expert, then proceeds to give a brilliant presentation explaining exactly why they are an expert on these things. But I think that it, it served to illustrate how this new, the new challenges, the new archaeology, I think we're at quite a, a crossroads in, in the discipline. Um, it, it feels like we're not expert, none of us are expert. So if we just all hold our hands up, fess up um, and share your work in progress, share your thoughts. Um, think, is it someone said thinking out loud earlier, but I forgot to write down who. Um, I think we need to do more of that. Um, and then uh, there was also comments um, this morning about the struggling to keep up with the scale of change and the rates of change. And I think I mean, that relates to actually what you were just saying, Ken, there's, there's really big changes, huge amounts of work, the nature of work is changing, the nature of what archaeologists could or are being asked to do um, is changing. And how we can shift from being part of the constraints to being the people who create and facilitate opportunities and solutions within that context, I think for me is, is a is a big theme, which I have heard more of in admittedly just this morning um, and talking to people, but it has felt more positive in that space than I think it, it has done previously. Um, we need to, uh, one of the speakers this morning um, in, the, in the session, so they need to, we need to create conditions for people to do the right thing. They were talking specifically about sustainability in a local government context. Actually, that applies to, to I think, most of the context that we're talking about here. Um, and, um, and I've seen a lot of discussion and, and listening to reflections on the other sessions around that. Um, then uh, another really important point, which is something that has come up in the work that I've been doing when working more closely with environmental, other environmental sector colleagues around language. Um, one of my colleagues this morning said, um, we need to talk to people in an accessible way. We need to be really aware of the language that we use for so many reasons. But when we are trying to engage with colleagues who aren't from our discipline, and even within our discipline, we need to be much more careful with the way in which we explain what it is that we mean and check that people have understood. Don't assume that you've got a common understanding just because someone's used the same words that you did. Um, and I'm going to sort of draw cheat and draw on the other conference that I've been at for two days before I came here, River Restoration Conference, um, which is very interesting being, we ran a session on heritage and river restoration. Um, and the colleagues in that session, they, they weren't familiar with archaeology. They weren't familiar with heritage. We were trying to explain how heritage might relate to the work that they were going to be doing. And this is an emerging area. The rate and scale of change for our rivers is going to skyrocket. And these are big old projects. Um, it was really interesting um, how um, they enjoyed what we offered in helping them think more holistically about landscapes, about rivers aren't just rivers, they also relate to their, you know, the, the valley and the wider catchments. And they'd never thought that archaeologists could also do that thinking at different scales. So mm -hmm. the synergies with these other disciplines, when we have the opportunity to talk to them, are huge. And I think it's huge, huge opportunities there. But um, the question is the point at which we can have those conversations and when do we get invited in? How can we kick the doors down if we're not being invited in? Did I see, uh, maybe it's a tweet or maybe I invited it. Someone said archaeologists are like vampires and don't have to wait to be invited in. So maybe I made that up. Um, thought it was brilliant, um, and, uh, but it's so true. So <laughs> be a bit more, bit less vampire maybe. Um, but one of the key takeaways for me from that river session was we were encouraging people to reach out. This is a, a warning, by the way, if someone phones you up and says, yeah, I've got a great idea, river restoration project, and I've heard archeologists love talking about this stuff. That's probably my fault, sorry. Um, but reach out and have a conversation 
don't wait for a very specific brief that's asked. If you ask for a trench devaluation quote for that, you'll, that's what you'll get. If you pick up the phone, if you reach out and say, we've got this project, we're not qu quite sure where archaeology is going to fit within it, you probably end up somewhere a bit more interesting. Might well cost you less, <laughs> but certainly everyone involved will be a lot happier. Um, so that's uh, yeah, linking across the, the conferences there. Um, that connects to another point around multidisciplinarity. So when we, we, we have to work as part of an environmental sector, um, we have to recognise that we are part of it. We're an environmental discipline. Um, and, and I think reaching out to our sister organisations, SAIM, the Chartered Institute for um, Ecologists and Environmental Management, a SIWEM, Chartered Institute for Water and Environmental Managers. This, this is, these are, I've been to some of their conferences. They're brilliant. Um, I did a session on biodiversity and heritage at one uh, SAIM conference. I think that might be a really interesting thing to explore. So, um, so po pose that to, to CIFA. Um, and finally, um, there's something around how we share. We, we're generating a lot of data information. There's a lot of things happening in parallel and at pace. How, how we actually share information and data and knowledge is a real challenge and CIFA has an absolutely central role to play for me, I think, to, in, in that. And it'd be really nice to see some very practical um, structures for amassing that information, not waiting until we've got final um, polished guidance of things, but can we use CIFA to help share some of our thinking out loud? Um, and, and that may help um, us navigate this quite rapid um, changing, um, what was it my colleague said, yeah, the uh, keeping up with the scale of change might become a little easier. Um, I'm going to leave it there. Obviously, I had hundreds of other thoughts, but um, patient. <laughs> thank you very much. And, and now on to Sakshi Sharana, brief introduction and then your remarks, please. Um, I'm Sakshi Sharana. Uh, I'm a student at UCL and I'm also on the committee for uh, C for Early Careers Special Interest Group. Um, these are just kind of some of observations and also some reflections, but it might be a bit fragmented because of that. Um, so from all of the sessions I've kind of been in, one of the points that kind of stood out is that a lot of archaeologists really need managerial training and that would definitely help make it a sustainable profession. Not And not just in terms of like, or how to be a manager, but in terms of how to work out logistics, how to do HR, how to do finances and things like that, because I think that just helps formulate a good business model upon which people can run their businesses and actually might pay their employees better and might not have to lay off people every single year or hire people, fire people every single year. Um, so that was one of the points that I found out. Another point to do with sustainability was that I feel like there was very little explicit mention of sustainability. And I don't know if that was just because of the sessions that I was in, but very few sessions actually kind of touched upon, um, sustainable futures, um, whether that was about climate change or about the profession. There was a lot of implicit talk about it and maybe indirect ways of reaching towards it, but very rarely did people kind of explicitly or directly be like, this is the problem, this is what we're doing right now, and this is maybe how we can come about this. And I feel like that's kind of a pattern that I've kind of been observing at, over the course of the conference, but also over the last like of last conference and then over the last four years of me studying and working in archaeology it's that we've been having these conversations every single year every single day and like everyone always says yeah we're having difficult conversations now but the point is we've been having them for ages and and nothing's being done about it and someone mentioned to me the other day, I don't know, and it's been mentioned a lot of times about the concept and the idea of change and how change is slow and it takes a while. 
And I agree with that to a certain extent, because yes, change can be slow. And especially when bureaucracy is involved, I understand bureaucracy. I'm not going to sit here and be extremely radical and say, no, change can happen immediately and overnight. Like, no, I understand that. But I don't think change has to be invisible, which is where it is at right now. I like I can't s see any actions actively taking place to change things. The, and over the course of the conference, I, I mentioned this earlier in one of the sessions, only Penny in uh, one of the men, uh, sessions kind of actually laid out a potential action that could have been, that can be done relatively instantly to kind of make things better. And that was relating to EDI. And that was the only thing. No one else has really talked more about a direct action. We've just kind of had the same conversations. Everyone's been frustrated, either in despair, as uh, Phil has mentioned, or been like happy that we had the conversation. Um, and another thing that's come up a lot is that oh yeah, we're doing a lot of research into these things. We're creating more and more publications. And yeah, as long as soon as the information is out there published, we'll do something, we'll be able to do something. It doesn't work that way. Same thing with the archaeosexism um, exhibition. It's not new information. Like women have been talking about this for decades. Why, like, why did it have to be in one room? Things that aren't even on the worst side of things. And these are things that probably almost every single woman in this room has probably experienced in one way or another. Why, why, has, why is it shocking to people? I find that a bit baffling. And it shouldn't be shocking. Everyone talks about this. Most of you have probably witnessed it in front of you or have heard about it by your female colleagues or by other colleagues, it shouldn't be shocking. Um, and the same thing about publications. Everyone knows the problems. Everyone knows there's a problem with pay. Everyone knows there's problems with diversity. Everyone knows there's problems with climate change. Do we really need to know the specific statistics and this and that and this and that? Why every time, yeah, sure, you take 10 years to create a publication, put it out there. What for? Things have changed by that point. What for? Just And then you spend another 10 years on an updated statistic. You know a problem exists. Work towards fixing it instead of trying to research into it. And everyone like likes to think there's a divide in academic and um development-led or commercial archaeology. But the point is the same. Everyone's just racing to put out papers and knowledge, but not really, really, or just putting more words out there on paper or on the internet. And another thing that was highlighted about was about the digital sphere and keeping up with the times. And I agree with that to a certain extent. But I'd also like to highlight that moving things to a digital sphere is not accessible. And it's it does not mean it's accessible. It does not mean you're keeping up with times. It does not mean anything. It it it's good in some ways, but it it's not necessary in all the ways. So I'd really like so, like when people talk about moving things to digital ways maybe take a step back and think about is that really what needs to be the focus right now what like what what are our priorities i think the priorities need to be looked at individually and be like what are the individual priorities what are the collective priorities of an organization of the discipline of the sector and then have a look at that and then like mike and megan mentioned in yesterday's um, session, and then we had some discussion on it in today's session as well, about work-life balances and what early careers people want. And we had a conversation about struggles, and it did get uncomfortable today. 
And mm. the thing is, yes, everyone in this room has gone through struggles. And it's not really about who had it worse and who's going through what and what the point is. If we have struggles, we have struggles, yes. But the point shouldn't be that everyone has to struggle. The point is, we should be trying to figure out a way to not have to struggle. And if people who are later in their careers or older have struggled, the point shouldn't be like, yeah, we've struggled and you have it worse. You don't have it worse. Like, it shouldn't be like that. Like, why are you complaining? No, like everyone is allowed to complain and talk about it, but also it shouldn't be bad and it shouldn't, young people shouldn't feel like they aren't allowed to complain or talk about their struggles for the fear of being told that they're just being too liberal or too radical or too immature and with their thoughts. No, like it's not about that. And we're not throwing temper tantrums around either. We just are choosing that, you know what, we're not satisfied with this. We don't want to struggle. We don't want to have to do a ridiculous amount of unpaid work and have no sense of work-life balance just to have a job that also doesn't really pay. And we're really paying to do a job that doesn't pay, doesn't make sense. And I think like the last thing I would really say is that archeologists are really, really obsessed with interpretations and narratives. And this isn't just like in this conference, this is in my degree as well. We're, we're obsessed with this idea and somehow manage to overcomplicate every single thing. How do we read into every single possible thing and make something that might take two minutes into a thing that takes three hours? Or how does everything become such a big thing? And everything doesn't have to be that deep. It's important when we're looking at artifacts to consider multiple possible interpretations but like it's this whole thing and like okay this is a bit vague and abstract but like for my research right now I looked at this concept of Freud that it started out the whole idea of interpretations where a pipe is never just a pipe and the thing is the way I would like to end it is that sometimes a pipe is just a pipe and can we please just accept that? <laughs>